All right, Philippians for Beginners, lesson number seven. The mature Christian seeks righteousness by faith. Part two, Philippians three, and we should cover verse seven to 21 in this uh, lesson. So in part two of this section, we're, uh, we're picking up Paul's argument for salvation based on faith, kind of in mid-thought here. He's challenging those teachers who were promoting salvation by a, a system adhering to various rules concerning food and marriage, the chief of these being the necessity of being circumcised in order to become a Christian. So he's challenging that idea that seems to be circulating in the church. These Judaizers uh, took pride in their Jewish heritage and they used this as a way uh, to authenticate themselves and give authority to the false teachings. We know what we're talking about. We're Jews, we're original Jews. You, you, you Christians, you Gentiles who became Christians, you're, you're Johnny-come-latelys. We're the real deal. We're, you know, what we say, this is, this is uh, original stuff. So in response to these teachers, Paul reviews his impeccable credentials as a Jew, superior to the false teachers, and undeniable sincerity and zeal as a Pharisee, who formerly was bound to destroy the church by attacking and uh, imprisoning its members. In other words, boy, you think you guys are Jews? Let me tell you about what a real Jew is, is all about, basically, is how he's uh, kind of responding to these guys. So in our last lesson, we covered the passage where Paul compares his Jewishness to that of the false teachers with the goal of demonstrating his superior standing and zeal for the law. All right, so let's get to chapter three, verses uh, seven to 21. In the next section, he's going to do three things. One, he's going to proclaim the superiority of God's method of saving people through Christ. He uses himself as an example of one who had a reason to boast in the flesh. Remember we said, boy, if, if anybody can boast in, having, you know, in being saved through the law, I could boast. A true Hebrew, he was a Pharisee, he was a persecutor of the church. You know, he, he checked off all the boxes as far as the law is concerned. And yet, and yet, he discarded all of these seeming advantages in order to follow Christ. So that's the first thing he's going to do. Secondly, he's going to explain what his, and by extension, every Christian's goal in life should be. And then thirdly, he's going to use himself a second time as an example of righteous living and warn those who are not following this particular example that he's going to give them. So Paul uses this chapter to make the argument that righteousness comes by faith. And when I say righteousness, meaning acceptability before God, that God accepts you, that's, that's the concept of righteousness. So he's going to make the argument that righteousness comes by faith and it produces righteous living, which is the true mark of Christian or spiritual maturity, not circumcision or not keeping food laws. Okay. Not the observance of rules and laws dictated by the false teachers and confirmed by the requirement to be circumcised. So let's examine more closely these ideas that Paul writes about in verses seven to 21 of Philippians. And this is, you know, this is the heart and soul of this particular uh, epistle. Now we need to remember that uh, what was at stake here was of supreme importance. And that is the manner in which a soul is saved and preserved for eternal life with God in heaven. That's important. The Judaizers were introducing a system of salvation that would not work. That's the whole idea. It didn't work. 1,500 years of Jewish history had demonstrated that the attempt to use the law as a tool to create righteousness in a man or woman did not work. Rule keeping, obedience to the law, this was not the way to become acceptable before God. Not because God didn't want that, but because human beings couldn't do that. That's the problem. In other words, using a system where adherence to rule of law to make someone acceptable to God never succeeded for two reasons. First of all, 
human beings were incapable of keeping the law perfectly and consistently. That was the problem. There was nothing wrong with the law, it was just how they were trying to use it. Paul summarizes this reality in Romans 3.23 when he says, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Notice he says all, and then in Galatians, another epistle talks about this. He says, as it is written, there is none righteous, not even one, there's none who understands, there is none who seeks for God. So human beings couldn't keep the law. If they could, that would be an acceptable way to become righteous. God would accept you. Oh, you've obeyed the law perfectly? Come on in, come on down. I accept you, you're perfect. But the law wasn't given for that reason. They were using it the wrong way. And as I just mentioned, it never succeeded because the law was given to reveal sin and its consequences. That's why the law was given, not, not to make people perfect. It wasn't given to create righteousness in man, it was given to reveal sin and the punishment for sin. Go back to Romans. Paul says, now we know that whatever the law says, it speaks to those who are under the law, so that every mouth may be closed and all the world may become accountable to God because by the works of the law, no flesh will be justified in his sight. No flesh, no human being will become acceptable, righteous in his sight, for through the law comes the knowledge of sin. That's the purpose for the law. It's there to show you that you're a sinner, I'm a sinner. So in answering the Judaizers, Paul, with his own experience of one who attempted to achieve righteousness using this system, he's saying, I know what I'm talking about concerning becoming accept acceptable to God using this system. I know what I'm talking about. I tried doing it my whole life. So his checklist of religious qualifications as a zealous Pharisee going all out to destroy the church was a badge that he wore proudly as one who believed sincerely that he was acceptable and righteous before God because of these things. I am so acceptable to God, why? Because I'm killing and I'm putting in prison those who you know, are following another religion. This checklist was also a way of showing that as far as being righteous through a system of law was concerned, Paul far surpassed any claims that the Judaizers might make in the, might, might make in this regard. So once this thought has been established, Paul then describes the transformation that took place in his life brought about by faith in Jesus Christ. So let's re go back to Philippians. We've wandered a few places here where we're back in Philippians verse seven. But whatever things were gain to me, what things? Well, you know, I was a Jew, I was a Hebrew of Hebrews, I was a Pharisee, all. whatever things were gain to me, those things I have counted as loss for the sake of Christ. The former status he described, which the Judaizers would consider as advantages in the pursuit of salvation, Paul now completely rejects and considers them as lost or damaged. What he once thought were advantages in obtaining righteousness were in truth disadvantages when considering salvation through a system that Christ has established. They didn't really help him as he once thought. They in fact hindered him from obtaining the righteousness he desired. The harder he, <laughs> the harder he you know, tried with the law, the further he got away from his goal. Keep reading verse eight. More than that. I count all things to be loss in view of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and count them but rubbish, so that I may gain Christ. So Paul amplifies his statement by declaring that when weighed against the knowledge of Jesus Christ, not just the knowledge of his ministry and his teaching, but the intimate knowledge of the person himself, Remember, Paul had been called directly by Jesus, Acts chapter nine, and he was encouraged and comforted directly by Jesus himself in Acts 18, nine to 11. So Paul's knowledge of both the teachings and the person of Christ 
surpass the worth of what he considered valuable before. In other words, his advantages as a prominent Jewish Pharisee and the sum of what he thought he knew about God and salvation and righteousness, everything he thought he knew, he says, down the drain, not worth a thing. His knowledge of Christ has reduced the value of these former things to the point of rubbish, nothing, worthless. He adds that even the things he has lost since becoming a Christian and then an apostle, well, what exactly has Paul lost? Well, his health, his freedom, his safety, his financial security, the respect of the Jewish community, we could keep on going. All of those things he lost. Even these things are also worthless, he says, when compared to the value of having Jesus Christ and what he has freely given and continues to give Paul. In other words, what I have now, <laughs> I wouldn't trade for anything. What I have now is worth more than all of these things that I had before put together. He says, and may be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own derived from the law, that was the old way of doing things, but that which is through faith in Christ, that's the new way of doing things, that's the effective way of doing things, the righteousness which comes from God on the basis of faith. Here Paul summarizes the reason for his transformation and rejection of what he valued in his former life. God has revealed through Jesus Christ the way righteousness, and of course the salvation that comes with it, is obtained. How do I get to being acceptable before God? Not through a system of law keeping, he says, but through a system of faith, and specifically faith in a person, and that person being Jesus Christ, the Son of God. So Paul believed in the true God, and he wanted the right thing. That's, that's, that's the amazing, he wanted the right thing. He wanted to be acceptable to God. That's the right thing. He wanted to be righteous and thus be saved. He wanted all the right things and he was asking the right person for it. However, he had the wrong system for obtaining these things, the law keeping system. God revealed the correct way to receive these things. And of course, as he says, faith, believing in, believing as true that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. That's the system, that's the way to receive this acceptability. Verse 10 that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being conformed to his death. So here he follows through by explaining what the faith in Christ system promised and delivered to him once that he believed. First of all, he witnessed the resurrected Christ on the road to Damascus. He was told when called and has since suffered as Christ suffered in the carrying out of his ministry. Paul also expected to die as a martyr since he had been assaulted and threatened with death many times. And so this epistle was written from a Roman prison while awaiting trial, and if he lost this case, he would be put to death by the Roman government. All of this, however, did not diminish the other promise made to him, and of course to all believers, and that includes us, that like the Christ he believed in, he also would experience a glorious resurrection from the dead. So his detractors, the Judaizers, they were surely using his imprisonment as a way of undermining his authority as a teacher and perhaps discounting his message of the gospel. You know, they were saying things like, are you kidding? If he's an apostle with God and he's got the true gospel, he's got the true message, what's he doing in jail? <laughs> You know, if he's so holy and good, what's he doing in jail? If he was doing what was right, according to God, you know, they wouldn't have put him in prison. I mean, you, you can almost, you, you can write this stuff. So Paul brushes aside any comparisons of his ministry or message by glorying in his uh, sufferings because they are the results of having received the truth concerning the most important issue in religion, and that is, how is one saved? Of course the devil's going to fight you on that one. And how is he going to fight you? He's going to use every instrument at his disposal, governments, armies, 
liars, you know, he's going to do everything to destroy you. Note, he doesn't even debate the Judaizers. Instead, he merely states that salvation is obtained through faith in Christ, not through any type of law-keeping system. That includes being circumcised. He doesn't specifically offer this as proof for his claim, but the fact that he considers his own attempt at gaining righteousness through law-keeping is rubbish, and has willingly given up every advantage and every comfort in his service to Christ, even ready to die for the faith, provides a powerful witness for his message. You know, what is said here, what is not said rather, but implied is the question, have the false teachers experienced the same knowledge of Christ and would they be prepared to lose as much in the service to their message? Just how much is their message costing them? I mean, you people, you, know, you have to be circumcised. You adult males have to go through that, but they don't. <laughs> they don't have to do that, you have to do that. So Paul's encouragement here, now that he's addressed the issue, false teaching regarding salvation, that's the issue, and indirectly referred to the false teachers by comparing his credentials and his experience and teaching to theirs, he's going to turn his attention back to his readers with exhortations to pursue spiritual maturity, and that's the theme you know, that we're following, because that's the main theme of this, of this letter, so we go to verse 12, he says, not that I have already obtained it or have already become perfect, but I press on so that I may lay hold of that for which also I was laid hold of by Christ Jesus. So here Paul states his case, his premise, which he will develop in the next few verses. The question that arises here is, what is the thing or what is the perfection that Paul pursues. He says, you know, I pursue, I'm, I'm, I'm going towards a goal. What is it? Well, the answer is in verse 11 and in verse 20. In the previous section, he, he explained that everything he has uh, and everything that he had lost because of Christ is worth nothing in comparison to what he now possesses as a Christian. And what is that exactly? Well, the hope of resurrection, that's what that is. Verse 11, he says, in order that I may attain to the resurrection from the dead. That's the jackpot, that's what he's chasing. Now in verse 12, he expands the thought by explaining that he has not yet experienced resurrection, not that I have already, you know, I haven't gotten it yet and the perfection that will accompany resurrection. We're not going to be perfected in this life, we're going to be perfected in the glorious body life. Christ, he says, laid hold of Paul on the road to Damascus when Paul was converted, so that one day Paul could himself lay hold of the resurrection and the eternal life promised to all faithful Christians. The perfection he speaks of is the full maturity of both knowledge and conduct in Christ that one will have when this mortal body is shed and the glorious eternal body is put on at resurrection. Again, we go to another letter from Paul to kind of explain that. In 1 Corinthians he says, now I say this, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God nor does the perishable inherit the imperishable. Behold, I tell you a mystery. We will not all sleep, remember sleep now in Christian terms means to be, to be dead. We will not all sleep, but we will all be changed in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised imperishable, and we will be changed. For this perishable must put on the imperishable and this mortal must put on the immortal. All right, keep that in mind and let's go back to Philippians, shall we? Here he says, brethren, I do not regard myself as having laid hold of it yet, but one thing I do, 
forgetting what lies behind and reaching forward to what lies ahead, I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. So he's talked about his own past and the transformation he has undergone along with references to the suffering that he has and continues to endure, but he says he doesn't dwell on these things. Yeah, this is happening. Yes, I've been beaten. Yes, I've given up everything you know, to follow. Yes, that's all true. He says his mind, however, is focused not only on the future in general, but a specific event in the future, and that is his own resurrection. It's a goal in the sense that it, 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 it guides his decisions and actions. It's a prize, not a payment, because it is a gift and not something that he could earn. There's nothing he could do to earn the resurrection. God gives that to him as a favor, as a grace. Why? Because he believes, that's why. So Paul's an apostle, but like every other Christian, he too pursues the upward call of God, which is the call to resurrection and eternal life through faith in Jesus Christ. If you've ever read this passage and wondered, what does he mean by the upward call? That I got to become a better person? That I got to, no. No, the upward call is the resurrection. That's the upward call. Upward, we're, we're raised up from the dead and everything that accompanies that. Now in verse 15, let's keep going. He says, let us therefore, as many as are perfect, here perfect means mature, have this attitude. And if anything, you have a different attitude, God will reveal that also to you. However, let us keep living by that same standard to which we have attained. So the perfect in this verse refers to spiritual maturity among those in the church. Well, who are the mature in the church that he's talking to? Well, the ones that haven't been carried away by these teachings of these, these false teachers about circumcision and obeying the law and all that stuff for salvation. The mature ones are the ones that have held on to the, you know, to the gospel. I haven't been swayed away from that teaching. Those are the, those are the mature. Not the, not the perfect state that one will have in resurrection. Paul addresses those who consider themselves mature in Christ, not new disciples or those with little knowledge in the scriptures. He encourages these people who have influence in the church because of their spiritual maturity to maintain the same attitude or standard, two words referring to the same thing, which is what Paul has just taught them. What's the standard? Well, the standard is we're saved by faith in Jesus Christ. That's the standard. And he's saying, don't be moved away from that standard. You people who are mature, who know the scriptures and who have experience in Christianity, don't you be moved away from the very thing that saved you. Don't run off with these, you know, these false teachers. There may be disagreements about various matters. But if they maintain the basic and the critical teaching concerning the gospel and faithful Christian living, he says, God himself will help them with understanding that will ultimately lead to unity. In other words, those who are mature need to maintain their belief and practice according to Paul's teaching and example. And if there are differences, these will be taken care of with God's help if they continue in the way that Paul has shown them. If, however, they, they veer off and go with the Judaizers, there's no help for you there. <laughs> there's no coming back from that stuff. Now Paul gives a warning in the last couple of verses that we said we were going to look at today. He concludes the section by turning his attention once again to the Judaizers. This time he warns the Philippians about their conduct and eventual ruin. The condemnation is directed at the Judaizers themselves, but the implicit warning is that if they copy their behavior, they will suffer the same consequences. So let's read verses 17. He says, brethren, join in following my example and observe those who walk according to the pattern you have in us. For many walk of whom I often told you and now tell you even weeping that they are enemies of the cross of Christ. 
whose end is destruction, whose goal is their appetite, and whose glory is in their shame, who set their minds on earthly things. So Paul repeats his previous exhortation to follow his example as one whose eyes are fixed on the heavenly goal. You know, you say, my eyes are open, I know where I'm going, follow me. And he tells them to live in the way that the quote perfect, meaning the mature Christians among them live. Instead of describing their lifestyle, Paul describes the very opposite lifestyle of those who are teaching the work circumcision method of salvation. And he mentions a few of their actions. First of all, he says they're enemies of the cross. They negate the power and purpose of Jesus as sacrifice by substituting a law work system. You know, if you're going to be circumcised, you don't need the cross of Christ anymore. You've just you know, pushed that away. He says they serve their own desires or their own appetites. Not necessarily food here or drink. That's not what he's talking about. What they do is guided by what they desire. What do they desire? Money, power. They don't desire the will of God. Thirdly, what they see as success or glory is in reality shameful before God. The Judaizers boasted in their followers who had exchanged their freedom in Christ for the futile effort to become righteous through the law. This exchange was seen as a victory by these teachers, but a term uh, but, the, but a terrible loss to the individuals and dishonoring God who sacrificed His Son. You know, these guys thought, well, we got another convert to our side. You know, another notch on the gun. You know, another notch on the false doctrine, if you wish, wish. And Paul says, there's no glory in this. There's no victory here. This is shameful. And then he says, they're devoid of the Spirit. Their teaching, their motivation, their thinking were not guided by the Spirit of God. The rewards they sought after were worldly, as I say, power, or money, or glory. So Paul mentions in verse 19 the end result of their lives and work, and that is destruction. He uses the word perdition, which refers not only to their lives here, but to their everlasting ruin. In the last two verses in this section or chapter, Paul immediately compares the goal and the result of the Judaizers, earthly things, destruction, he compares that to what awaits those who are faithful. And then we read the last verses in our study today, verse 20 and 21, he says, for our citizens, so he talked about them now, but then he says, but our citizenship is in heaven from which also we eagerly wait for a savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. What does he mean, wait for a savior? Well, we're waiting for the return of Jesus, who will transform the body of our humble state into conformity with the body of His glory. Whoa, wait a minute, what does that mean? Well, our body's going to be like His body, by the exertion of the power that He has even to subject all things uh, to himself. Well, what does that mean? To, to subject all things, what? including what? Including death. He has power over death. How, how do we resurrect? Well, you know, death has us. Jesus has power over death. He removes death from us. We're able to rise. That's the point. So note the way that Paul provides more detail to what he only referred to as, quote, the prize in verse 14. Where? Well, Christians are citizens of heaven, that's where, not earth. We're only pilgrims here. Our true home is in heaven. Who? Well, Jesus Christ is the one we eagerly await to bring us there. Not the law, not rule keeping. What? He removes the physical body through death and equips us with a new glorious body that will enable us to exist with God in the spiritual dimension called heaven. Our new glorious body will be like His body. Well, what is that like? Well, think about the transfiguration, Matthew 17. You know, his body was bright, the light shone through it. He wasn't subject to time or material you know, limitations. Think about the angels, the way the angels appeared and the things that the angels were able to do. This gives us a concept of what that glorious body will be like. How? Well, Jesus is God and as God, 
has divine power to create and to transform. Paul refers to the extent of Jesus' power to subject all things to himself. In other words, the one who rules the physical and the spiritual worlds has the power to both resurrect us from the dead and fit us with a glorious eternal spiritual body. And so Paul encourages the Philippians to avoid being influenced by the Judaizers and their false and destructive teachings, which he warns will bring to utter ruin these teachers and their followers. Instead, he instructs them to follow his lead in staying focused on the prize awaiting every faithful Christian, and that is resurrection and eternal life with God in heaven. You know, a wider application of this if, if we don't have the time to do this, but think about this. You know, he's, 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 uh, he's uh, teaching against this uh, uh, salvation by a system of works here. You got to do something. Have you ever realized that every other religion, I'm not talking about Catholic, Baptist, I'm not talking about within the, you know, Christianity, I'm talking about every other religion okay, that man has invented operates on a system of law and works, every single one of them. The one thing that all the religions in the world have in common is they all, they all operate based on the law. You got to do something in order to get to nirvana. You got to do something to obtain moksha. You know? You've got to do something to get to your paradise if you're a Muslim. You've got to pray five times a day. You, gotta, you always have to do something. No matter how the religion is designed and what, holy books they have and they got a gazillion people gathering for their yearly festivals. All of it is law keeping, period. That's, that's, that's its weakness, law keeping. So Philippians is a, is a book, is a, is a treatise about how God actually saves human beings and brings them to himself. Very important to remember that. This is the heart and soul of Christianity. Okay, a couple of you know, little lessons here from this passage, <clears throat> forget yesterday. <laughs> when we think of the past, we usually focus on our failures. Why is that? What would I have done differently? God will never forgive me for that. If I only knew then what I know now, etc., etc. Continually dwelling on the past failures or even past successes has a way of immobilizing us in the present. It's what people do when they don't want to move forward with their lives. They look to the past. Now it's okay to consider the past when making decisions about the future, but we have to resist the temptation to live there because in doing so we often fall uh, victim to doubt and depression and despair. Forget the past, forget it. Lesson number two, live for today. Jesus tells his disciples that the Christian's daily task is to seek the kingdom in all that we do, whether it's in the way we do our jobs or the manner that we deal with people or the strategies we use to solve problems or serve people around us. He promises that he will work things out in such a way that while we are focused on that daily task, and that is seeking his will and purpose for our lives, he promises that he will make sure that our daily needs are met. So living for today has a way of checking that impulse that draws our attention to the past. If we invest today's allotment of spiritual and emotional energy given to us by God to deal with today's issues and demands, and we take that energy and we invest them in a futile effort to remake or mourn over things that happened in the past, we then have nothing left to deal with life as it is today. This is one of the reasons why people who obsess about the past are always tired. They don't have enthusiasm. They have no energy. Why is that? Well, they've used today's resources on a useless effort to relive or fix yesterday. They got nothing left for today. That's, that's why. <laughs> Don't go there. And then thirdly, focus on the goal. No one gets to heaven by mistake. 
<laughs> you know what I'm saying? It's not, it, the scene is not guy coming along and oop, he trips and he goes, where am I? Well, this must be heaven. I never thought I'd get, you know, that, that's in the movies. <laughs> Nobody gets to heaven by mistake. Paul the apostle, who was a great worker for the Lord, who performed miracles, he converted many people, he planted churches, he wrote at least 14 of the 27 New Testament epistles, and yet he made sure that he stayed focused, not simply on the future in general, but on the one goal he had, which was in the future. And that goal had three stages. Stage number one, conscious resurrection from the dead. That's another thing that is different from all other religions or most other religions. Many other religions, your life after death is that you're just sucked up into the great you know, power, but you have no consciousness after death. So the goal, resurrection, has three stages. Conscious resurrection from the dead. Paul would still be conscious of who he was after resurrection. How do we know that? Well, Moses and Elijah appear as themselves on the Mount of Transfiguration in Mount Matthew 17. Peter recognized who they were. They were in their glorified state, but he knew who they were. If he knew who they were, you'd think they knew who they were too, wouldn't you? Second stage, a glorious body. He would equip, or we would equip, with a glorified body similar to that of angels. Why? Because this body right here could not be sustained in a perfect spiritual world. It would disintegrate. You know, it'd be like going to the sun. You know, the closer we got to the sun, we would just burn up, right? The closer we get to God in this flesh, we would just burn up. We can't survive. We need a new body that will be able to be sustained in the spiritual uh, dimension. And then number three, those resurrected will be exalted to the right hand of God and participate in an eternal existence within the Godhead. Ephesians 2.6, 2 Timothy 2.12, Revelation 2.26 and 7, if you want verses for that. Imagine, we share the existence with God within the Godhead. We'd be at the right hand of God with Jesus. So remaining fixed on this goal provides the motivation to forget the past and persevere through present difficulties. Remember, it's an old adage, but it's so true. God never said that getting to heaven would be easy, but He assures us that it'll be worth the effort. Be worth the effort. This is why Paul in 2 Timothy, for example, can rejoice and can be ready to go, you know, because he knows where he's going and he knows what he's going to find when he gets there. Okay, there's uh, Philippians. All right, we're dismissed. Thank you.